you have your Bibles this morning, I would like for you to open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's where we're going to spend most of our time this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I have PowerPoints, and I will try to make sure that I click through them. Please forgive me if I don't. Just pay attention to what I say. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Our text this morning is verses 1 through 8. Corinth was an ancient city in Greece. Uh, the ruins of it is still there today. You go over to ancient Greece and you can still see the ruins of, of ancient Corinth. They had temples all over the place to Apollo and to Aphrodite and all of the different Greek gods. And the time that Paul visited this city, it was a metropolis. Close to probably 500 to 700,000 people lived in this ancient city in the early 50 A.D., and even in Paul's time, as, and even in the Roman culture as pagan and as uh, being known for sexual immorality, Corinth stood above even all the cities in Greece uh, for their uh, sexual immorality. They were known for this in, this in this ancient city. And so this is where Paul comes on his second missionary journey and establishes a church. He preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ to these, believe, these people in Corinth, and he establishes a, establishes a church there. And the Bible says in Acts 18.11 that such a door for effective ministry was open that he ended up staying there a year and a half just teaching and discipling these uh, new believers in Corinth. And after staying there a year and a half, Paul decides he, he wanted to keep moving on. He, he wanted to take the gospel to more places in the Roman Empire. And so after establishing this church, he takes his leave of them. And a couple of years later, on his third missionary journey, Paul winds up in another ancient city, the city of Ephesus. And it's from this city, a few years later, that Paul writes this letter that we're going to look at to the church in Corinth. And this church in Corinth was a mess. It's not unlike... A lot of churches today, because in this church, in this body of believers here, we have a whole range of people in their maturity in the Christian walk. Some who are just starting, some who have been walking with the Lord for a long time, and everything in between. But at this Corinthian church, they were all new believers. They didn't know anything about the God of Israel or this gospel that Paul was preaching. So everything that Paul taught them for the year and a half he was there, and from the time that he was gone, was all new to them. And so this church was just full of problems. So much so that a couple of times, Paul sends out, Paul sends out some of his main lieutenants. He sends out Timothy to help restore order and teach and instruct this church. And even before this letter that we have here in front of us, Paul had written another letter. We don't have that letter. He had written another letter instructing them, teaching them, trying to help them. And let me give you, just before I get to our main text this morning, I want to give you just a really an oversimplified view, uh, a bird's eye view of 1 Corinthians, what Paul is doing in this letter before we get to the text that I want to look at. In this letter that he's writing to these Corinthian believers, he's addressing all kinds of problems that this uh, church is experiencing. And he's not only addressing the problems, he's writing to correct these problems, to help them, to encourage them, to teach them so that they don't keep living like they're doing. And so in the first four chapters, he covers schisms. There, there was division in the church. Some people were for Paul. They loved Paul. They loved Paul's teaching. And there were some other gifted teachers in this church. And so some of the people in this church loved those teachers more than Paul. Loved Apollos and the, the guy named Peter. They, they loved these teachers, and so they were breaking apart into groups of, well, he's my teacher, he's my teacher. And Paul deals with that in the first four chapters. And then in chapters 5 through 8, he starts dealing with more interpersonal relationships. He starts dealing with some of the sexual immorality that's going on at the Corinthian church. He deals with uh, husbands and wives and those who are engaged to be married and just how we treat one another. And then in, verse, in chapters 9 through 14, he deals with just problems that they were having in worship in general. Just when they gather together, as if what I just said was not enough problems, when they gather together to fellowship, to worship, 
There were problems with that too. And so in chapters 9 through 14, Paul writes to address those problems, to correct those problems, to teach them and instruct them. And that brings us to our text here this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul is going to be addressing another problem in this chapter. Now for our purposes this morning, we're not going to look at the problem uh, in the specifics of what he talks about. But the problem is this, in verses 12 through 34, the, the Corinthian believers, some of, those, some of the people in the church, they may not be believers, but some of the people in this Corinth church were saying, there is no resurrection. People don't rise from the dead. Once you die, that's it. Life is over. You're in the grave and that's where you stay. Period. No resurrection. And so in chapter 15, Paul writes to correct this. So let me just read the text to you, what we're going to be covering this morning, and then we'll dive into it. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, Paul writes this. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he, was, that he was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And since Paul's main point here in building to correct this problem is to remind these believers, these Corinthians, of the gospel he preached to them, I think it's best if instead of starting in verse 1, we start at verse 3. We will take a look at the gospel that he preached to them, and then we'll come back and pick back up in verses, verses 1 and 2. First Corinthians 15.3, Paul says this, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. Notice, first of all, before we dig into the meat of this, that this gospel that Paul preaches, this, this, this word gospel, it means good news, glad tidings, a happy message. This good news that he preaches is not something that Paul made up. It's not something that he invented, that he, crea that he had created. He says that, that what I delivered to you is of first importance, what I also received. This gospel was given to Paul. In another letter he writes to the Galatians, he says this, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. This good news, this, this happy message that Paul proclaimed to these Corinthians was not something he made up. Jesus himself entrusted Paul with this message. And so when he came preaching this gospel, he's given them the very words of Jesus to them. Jesus had chosen Paul, God had chosen Paul, set Paul apart, called Paul to be a messenger, to be a preacher, a proclaimer of his word. In another letter, the letter that we're studying here on Sunday mornings, he starts it this way. Paul, a servant, a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. God called him. You, you come follow me. I want you to be my messenger. Set apart for the gospel of God. Paul was set apart from his life as he knew it so that he can make known the riches of God's grace. Paul's aim... Paul's purpose, what he lived for, and what he would die for, was to make this gospel known, to proclaim it everywhere that he went. He tells a group of Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, he says, I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And so, what Paul had received, what he had been entrusted with, what he had been given, 
He faithfully proclaimed that. He, he faithfully relayed that message. He gave what Jesus had given to him to these Corinthian believers. And he says, I deliver to you as of first importance this is the main thing. If you want to know what a Christian believes, if you want to know what Christianity is about, this gospel that Paul preaches, this message that he preaches, this is it. This is the heart of Christianity. The number one thing, nothing else compares to it. And it says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. But first of all, I want to I want to take this phrase in accordance with the Scriptures. What does that mean? What does he mean when he says Christ died in accordance with the Scriptures? What Paul is referring to is what we as Christians have in, in, in the Bible, in the Scriptures that we have, the, these, these writings that we have from followers of God. And he's specifically talking about the Old Testament writings, the writings of the Jewish people. The law and the prophets, the Psalms and the histories, these things where the God of Israel revealed himself to a people, revealed that he was the creator and sustainer and giver of life, that he created all things for himself, for his glory. And it was all very good. And he created man. You're not here by some random uh, chance of chemicals and um, chance happening through millions of years of just forming and forming, and so here you are. That is not what the Scriptures teach us. The scripture teaches that God is the creator, giver, and sustainer of all life. And that's what is in these scriptures that Paul is referring to. And he tells that how that God is the creator, that we as man have rejected him as creator. We don't like him being boss, the Lord, the creator, and we've rejected him. And in those Old Testament scriptures, because of that, you see that the world, even to this day, is plunged in ruin. If you want to know what's wrong with the world today, it's us. Those scriptures not only tell us what men and certain, certain men and certain women did and what they said and the places they went, it not only tells us that, but we also hold that it is the very words of God. Paul writes, to Timothy, all Scripture is breathed out by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction, and for training in righteousness. These, these Scriptures that Paul's appealing to in accordance with the Scriptures is the very Word of God. And so when Paul says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, he means just as it has been taught, just as it had been foretold, just as it, as it had been prophesied, just as God said, so it was. That's what he means in accordance with the Scripture. Just as God said it was going to be, that's what happened. And also in these texts, in this Old Testament Scriptures that we have, God foretold of one who was to come. God told the people of Israel who he entrusted these scriptures with, that he was going to fix what was broken, that he was going to send someone to fix what was wrong with us and what was wrong with the world. Before Moses died, he gave these instructions to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Moses said this in verse 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And then in verse 18, the Lord himself, God himself confirms what Moses has just said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command. So there's a prophet that God is going to bring, one who speaks his word, one who, who tells us what God has said, what is, what is God's will. God is sending someone like that. In Psalm chapter 2, I don't have this... This text, you could write that down. In Psalm 2, the psalmist tells of an anointed one, a, a, a Messiah, a Christ, a, a, a precious son, an anointed son who will rule over all. He's coming. Even more astonishing than that, we read this every Christmas uh, here in America, 
Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a son. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The one that God is going to send is going to come through a virgin birth. And he's going to be called Emmanuel. That word literally means God with us. And another place in Micah 5, 2 uh, an, another prediction, another foretelling of what God was going to do. He says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephratah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come from me, forth from me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. And what these two verses mean, what God is revealing through these scriptures, is not only was he sending a prophet, uh, an anointed one of Christ, but he himself was coming. He was going to be the prophet and the priest and the king, the, the one who was going to come and tell us the very words of God. And so the gospel that Paul taught, the gospel that he received, was that Christ has come, and that Christ was Jesus of Nazareth. And all throughout the New Testament, this is the testimony of all who knew Jesus. They testified everywhere on all occasions, Jesus is the Christ. He is the one that was foretold. Luke chapter 2 writes, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Let me back up. Along with that Christ, I'll read that scripture in a second. Um, that God was coming, he also said he was going to shepherd his people. He was going to be a shepherd. That's what these two passages are. Let me read these. Behold, the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and he will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. He says again in Ezekiel, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed. And I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat, and the strong, and those who are arrogant, and those who think they have it all, I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. And so, to say what I said again, the one who was to come, the prophesied Christ, the Messiah, the shepherd, God in the flesh. Paul's message was, he has come. Christ is here. He had came. And it was Jesus of Nazareth. And so in Luke, we read this, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ, the Lord. Jesus himself identifies himself as the good shepherd, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And everywhere, after Jesus' death and resurrection, everywhere his apostles, everywhere his followers went, this is, what, this is the kind of things that they preached. Every day, in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease, to te cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. The very one who wrote this letter, the Apostle Paul who wrote the letter of Corinthians, says this about him when he was first converted. Saul increased all the more in strength, and he confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Another of Jesus' disciples put it this way. John starts his gospel like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus, um, John identifies Jesus with the Word, the expression of God, the very ideal of God, the very representation of God. And it says that this Word was God Himself. And then a few verses later in verse 14, He says, the Word became flesh. God took on flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is of the, as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Paul writes to the Colossians, Jesus, He, He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the fullest expression of who God is. The writers of Hebrew was even more explicit. He started his, his epistle this way, Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Here again is another affirmation that the very words that we have, 
is from God. These are the very words of God that he has given to us. And there was a time that God spoke to people in many ways and in many times through the prophets. But he says here, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Jesus Christ is the fullest, final revelation of who God is. Of all that you need to know about God and what he desires and requires for your life, Jesus is the one who reveals that. He says he is the one who is the appointed heir of all things. He is the anointed son, the anointed ruler. All people, all things, he will rule over. And it said in 1 John, just as it says here, he is the creator of all things. He created the world. He continues on in verse 3. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprints of his nature. It means that Jesus is the brilliance of God's glory. All that God is in his beauty and his majesty and all of his perfections, you see that in Jesus. Jesus is the perfect representation of all that is. The invisible God is made visible through Jesus Christ. The exact representation of his nature. And he upholds the universe. He maintains all the molecules. He holds them all together by his word. He maintains it. And after he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So the good news that Paul brought to this Corinthian uh, city, the city of Corinth, is that the prophet, the shepherd, the Messiah, God the Son, the Christ had come. And it says, I deliver to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died. It is a brute fact of history that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. All four gospel writers recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of them record that Jesus was crucified. He was condemned under Pontius Pilate. He was led to Golgotha, and there they crucified him. And not only that, we have historians, Roman historians, many Roman historians that give credence, that give testimony that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. Tacitus and Josephus and Suetonius, just to name three. There are many others that confirm what the Scriptures teach, that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. And you might think, well, how is that a help? If God was going to send a shepherd, if God was going to send a prophet, if God was going to send one who would undo and fix all that was wrong with us and this world, why did he die? But that was the plan. Jesus, the, the text says Christ died for our sins. Jesus' life wasn't taken from him. He wasn't just murdered on a cross and condemned to death. Jesus gave his life. He died for sins. He says this himself in the passage we read a little while ago. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And a few verses later he says this, For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. No one took his life from him. But I lay it down of my own accord, and I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my Father. That was the plan the whole time. There was never a time that that wasn't the plan. Jesus came to save sinners. He says it in Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man came not to be served. The king, the prophet, the priest, the one who was coming, the shepherd, he did not come for people to serve him. He came to serve. How? How did you come to serve? To give his life as a ransom for many. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, the very first sermon that Peter preached after Jesus' resurrection says this, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. 
God in his infinite wisdom and his, his infinite mercy to undo the damage that you and I have done sent Christ to die for sinners, to die for sins. Sin is not a very popular word in American culture today. I don't know how it is from, if you've ever heard that word from the other countries you're from, but in America, people don't like the word sin. The Greek word literally means to miss the mark. That's what the Greek word means. And it means something like this. There is a standard. There is there's some bullseye. There is some, uh, something that we're aiming at. Some right. Some great good. And that's the aim. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're trying to hit. And sin means you've missed the mark. You didn't hit it. You, you missed the bullseye. You didn't live up to the standard. That's what sin means. And perhaps you're thinking, well, it doesn't sound so bad. You just missed the mark. We're just aiming for the mark. We're just a little bit off. But my friend, it would be a grave mistake to think that. Sin is an assault on the holy character of God. It is a corruption of his good world that he has made, and he hates it. Isaiah 6.3 says this, that there's these angels in heaven and they're called seraphim. They have six wings. And scripture says with two they cover their face, with two their feet are covered, and with two they fly. And constantly, all the time, forever and ever, this is what they do. One call to the other and said this, they say this to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. God is a holy God. That means he is separate from everyone and everything. There is nothing like him in all of creation. God himself stands apart and separated from creation. And he is holy. That means there is no impurity, no imperfection, no sin, nothing in him that is wrong. The Apostle John puts it this way. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. This is the message that he had heard from Jesus, the one who was going to speak the words of God to him. This is the message that he heard. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. What that means is, is God is pure. There's no darkness in him. His very being is perfection. You cannot find a perfection in him. He always does what is right. He will always do what is right. He never changes. He never becomes better and he never becomes worse. He's perfect, pure light. And Mary, in her song, after she had found out that she was going to be pregnant with the very Lord that we're talking about, says that, he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. God's very name is holy. The Bible is clear on God's stand and how he feels about sin. This is what it says in Psalm. You are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before you eyes. You hate all evildoers. Someone once asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and by asking that, they wanted to know what it was they could do to please God. How, they could, how could they live to be acceptable to God? That's, that's what was behind the question when they said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Which is the most important one? Out of all the commandments that you've given us, what's the top one? What do I have to do? What is it? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second is like it. 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Give me a second. I've been battling a sinus infection. And now it's... <clears throat> On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now when Jesus said this to this man... And just as you have heard it, he should have been cut to the heart and you should have been cut to the heart. We all should have been cut to the heart. And when Paul preached this to the Corinthians, they were cut to the heart. Because not the Jewish people, not the Corinthian people, not you or I, none of us have loved God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not thanked him as he deserved to be thanked. We have not lived in a way that exalts him and gives praise to his name. We have not even thought about him from day to day. We have not honored him with how we speak and how we treat one another. You and I know how we have treated people and how we have thought about them how we're jealous of them when they have something good happens to them and you wish it was you instead. You can't be happy for them because you hate them. No one has fulfilled these two commandments. Paul says it again in Romans 3, for all have sinned, all people have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And because of that, Paul writes again, because we have fallen short, because we have not honored God as God, because we have not loved one another, the wages of sin, the, the payday, what you get for sin is death. Every single one of you, including me, all of us will die one day, some sooner, some later. All of us and every person who has ever lived has died and it's because of sin. Sin has brought corruption into God's good creation. It has corrupted us and it kills us. And if that weren't enough, just that our lives are taken away, there's more. Because this life that you live now is not all that there is. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. And after that comes judgment. What that means is, is the life that you have been given, that you have been loaned, that you have been gifted with, is meant to be lived in the light of, my life is not my own. The very breath that I take is loaned to me from God, and I'm meant to live with all my heart, soul, and mind, and strength to glorify Him. And so when it says after this, after a man dies, judgment, it means that you and I, all of us, the Corinthians, everyone has ever lived, will give an account of themselves before God of how they have lived. And Jesus tells about it in Revelation 20, at the consummation of all things, when all things are being wrapped up, when God brings full and final salvation, when he takes away the sins of the world and all wickedness, And John writes this, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, the throne of God. And books were opened. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in those books according to what they have done. And you will be judged by God one day for what you have done, for how you have lived your life, for how you have followed those great commandments. That should be alarming. That should be very alarming to you and to me because it certainly was to these Corinthian believers. If God hates evil and if evil can't dwell with him, if he can't even look upon evil and he will punish evil, then what hope is there for you and I? What chance do we have to stand before a holy and righteous God? What can you and I give to God who is the giver of everything that he might accept us? Well, thankfully, the scriptures also teach that God is merciful and he's gracious 
slow to anger. He abounds in steadfast love and faithfulness. And so, when Paul says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, it means that God in His grace and in His mercy and His kindness pitied us. And that Christ died for our sins. It means that Jesus gave Himself in the place of sinners, ones who have not honored God, who have not loved their neighbor. That in their place, Jesus took on the punishment that was due to you and I. Peter writes it like this. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus had no sin. He never once sinned. He always did what was pleasing to the Father. Scriptures teach us that those two great commandments, He fulfilled them. He did love God with all of His heart, soul, mind, and strength, and He always loved His neighbor as Himself. Jesus was righteous. And so Christ dying for our sins, it means that the righteous for the unrighteous, and this is why, to bring you to God. Jesus Christ died that He might bring sinners to a holy God. He was put to death in a body, but made alive in a spirit. He writes again a little bit earlier, Peter. He himself, Jesus himself, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And just as it said a moment ago that Jesus Christ died in accordance with the Scriptures, even so he did. In the book of Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6 says this, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with His wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to His own way, and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Christ died for our sins. And the text says in verse 4 that he was buried. And what that means, it was a confirmation that Jesus really did die. He died upon the cross. You don't bury, hopefully not, people who are alive. Jesus was dead. He was laid in a tomb near where he was crucified, and at least four people saw that tomb, saw where he's placed in that tomb. Two of the people, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, were rulers in the Sanhedrin of the high council that ended up condemning Jesus to death. Two of those men were, had their hand in burying Jesus. So when it says that he was buried, it's a confirmation that Jesus was dead. He did die. But then the text goes on to say, he was raised on the third day in accordance with Scripture. What that word means when it says he was raised, what that means is what Paul is saying here is Jesus was brought back to life. Jesus was resurrected. He was dead and buried in a tomb. And God raised him from the dead. This has been the testimony of every Christian since the start of the church. This was the testimony of all of his followers. Everyone who knew Jesus, who walked with him, this is the testimony they gave. I'm going to give you a few just to show you, but it's all over the place. Acts 2, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This Jesus, verse 32, this Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses. A little bit later, another sermon Peter is preaching. He tells them this in verse 15 of chapter 3. You killed the author of life, talking to his Jewish audience, those Jews who had rejected Jesus. You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead, and to this we are witnesses. Acts 4 Another sermon, let it be known to, you, to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing well before you. 
Acts 5, another sermon. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on a tree. Acts 10, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Acts 13, but God raised him from the dead and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are now witnesses to his people. This is exactly what Paul says in the rest of our text. That this Jesus Christ who was raised, he was seen by people. It wasn't a story that they made up. They didn't think that they saw the ghost of Jesus. They saw him. And here in verses 5 through 8 of the, the text that we've been looking at, Paul gives you a list of witnesses. He says it. The one that was raised, Jesus, he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Cephas is just another name for Peter, the apostle Peter. Jesus appeared to P Peter after his death. And then he appeared to the twelve. The twelve is just a title for the men that Jesus had selected to be his closest followers. Those people who he entrusted with this message. This message that I'm telling you now. They saw him. And in verse 6, look at this. This is what Paul is writing to these Corinthians. Then he appeared, then Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. He means that. That's a way of saying he died. But look at what he says. Jesus appeared to more than 500 people at the same time. This was no apparition. This was no hallucination. This was, nothing, this was not something that these people had made up. Jesus Christ was really raised from the dead, and he showed himself by many proofs that he was raised from the dead. And he appeared to these people, showing them that he was alive, that me, myself, the one that was crucified, am here before you, alive. And it's almost like Paul is inviting. He's, he, he's challenging us. Investigate these things. Go and see. There's 500 people that saw him alive. Go and talk to them. In verses 7 and 8, then he appeared to James. James was Jesus' brother. Jesus' own brother for the life of Jesus didn't believe Jesus. Didn't believe Jesus was who he was even after the resurrection. And it wasn't until the resurrected Jesus appeared to James that James was changed. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And then he appeared to all the apostles, all those ones who God had chosen for himself to, to declare this message. In verse 8, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Jesus Christ has been risen from the dead, my friends. And because of that, it's a vindication of on all that he taught and all that he said. God validated Jesus' life and death and his ministry. And by raising him from the dead, he has declared him to be, shown him to be just who he said he was. And that's what Paul says. Paul, servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. I read that earlier which he promised beforehand through, the, through his holy prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son, who is descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be, shown to be, proven to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And it was just as the scriptures were told. He was raised in accordance with the scriptures. Psalm 16, David writes this, Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. It's a, it's a Hebrew word for the grave. Or let your Holy One see corruption. God revealed to David life, the paths of life. God made known to David in this text the resurrection. The Holy One would not see corruption. And then again, the Isaiah passage again. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And that though the Lord makes, him, makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, 
My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he had poured out his life into death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercessions for the transgressors. Jesus Christ is the risen Lord, and he is Lord over all, everything and everyone. And he is the judge, and there is a fixed day on which God will judge the world, all people, by Jesus. That is the gospel that Paul preached to these Corinthians. That is the gospel that when Paul came to this city, he explained it. In greater detail for a year and a half, that is the gospel. And so in verse 1 when he says, Now I would remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. And Paul trying to correct these problems, is also, it's, it's almost like he's saying, you, you remember the gospel I preached to you, right? You did receive it, didn't you? You, you have believed, haven't you? Because he writes, there was a time, we ourselves, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hating one another, hating others and being hated. Paul says, you remember there was a time before you had received Jesus, before you had heard the gospel. You remember that time, right? And Paul could rejoice with these Thessalonian believers, another city that he had went to and established a church. He says, we thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. In verse 2 he says, this gospel that you received, which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. The gospel is not only our hope at some point in the past, at some point in the past we believed, and it's not only some hope just for today that today we're standing in the gospel, but this gospel is what will carry us through to the end of our days, all of our days, whatever those days may be, long or short, hard or easy. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is what will sustain us and carry us through to his presence. God has done this work. He himself has sent a Savior to rescue people from our sins, and that is what he's done. And Paul says, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, you might think, well, you just said that God had done all this work, that God had sent a Savior, that he was the one doing, doing all this work. What's Paul mean here when he says, if you hold fast to the word? I thought you said God did all this. How is it the case that if God does it, we have to hold fast and cling to it? Well, God does this work by working in us so that we would cling to it. That is how God works. That is how God sustains you through the gospel. Paul says something very similar in Philippians chapter 2. He says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed this gospel, so now not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Two things are happening here. God is working, and they're working. And it's the same thing. It, it perfectly illustrates what we have just said. That this work of salvation, it is God's work. He is the one who has done it. All of it. And us holding fast to the word is this. It, 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 we cling to him, we hold to him because he's working in us. If God was not working in us, we would have no desires, no affections. We would not desire him at all. He says, this gospel that you receive, that you stand on, and by which you're being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. And what Paul means here is that they had heard this gospel. They had heard the greatest news that they are ever going to hear in their life. And they thought, that's nice. They didn't receive it. They didn't welcome the news. They didn't believe the news. They, they, they didn't believe it for any value. 
They believed it for nothing. That's what vanity, in vain, for nothing. It was worthless. It was all for nothing. And Paul was not like that. He will say a few verses later in verses 9 through 11 in the same chapter, after he has said the Lord appeared to him, he says, I'm the least of all the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. This gospel that Paul proclaimed to the Corinthians, you too have heard this morning. And this is what Christians believe, and this is the gospel of God. This is what God has done to rescue us from our sins. And there's not a person sitting here that should not feel the weight and the heaviness of that message. And I ask all of you, all of you, to consider very carefully what you have heard here this morning. That you would not just walk away from this and think, but that you would feel the weight of these words and you would understand that you yourself would know that you have not loved God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know that to be the case. And you know that you have not loved your neighbor. You have not treated the person beside you or your loved ones or your friends down the road the way they ought to be treated, and you know that. All of you know it. I know it. I have it. So the question might be, how can I be saved? How can you be saved? What do I have to do to escape judgment? What can I do that when I give an account for my life on the judgment day, what hope is there for me? It was very similar to 1 Corinthians 15. They received the gospel. This gospel that you have heard this morning, you welcome it. It's the greatest news that you will ever hear. And you receive it as such. You receive these words of life and you love these words. You think that's the best news I've ever heard. Here's another way of saying it. To all who received him, Jesus came to his own people and his own people rejected him. But it says to all who did receive him, and this is what this receiving means, who believed in his name. That means you've, you've entrusted yourself to him. You've, you've placed your life into his hands. He gave the right to become the children of God. And then he says, this is the work of God, that you believed in him and whom he has sent. Let me share one final one, and I'm closing. I'm sorry I went over time. Mike will preach this soon. And so since he will unpack the riches of these verses, I'm not going to pack them in their fullest. I'm just going to say what it says here so that you might know what you need to do to be saved. Because that's what he's teaching in Romans 10. What does it say? What does the Scripture say? And the Word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. This salvation that you long for is not something that you have to go and work especially hard for. You don't have to climb a high mountain. You don't have to do these arduous tasks it says the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. The word of faith that we proclaim, the very message that we're proclaiming, that I have proclaimed to you this morning. It says if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Every one of you, all of you, turn from your sins. Turn from your wickedness. Lay down your arms and your rebellion that you have fought against God. Lay them down. And humble yourself and come to him. Put your faith in him. Trust him for your very life. Believe that what you have heard here this morning will save you. That these eyewitnesses and these messages have come to you. That Jesus has been raised. You believe that. 
And it is your hope. It is the only thing that you have that you cling to with all of your heart. And you will be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, praise your holy name. Lord, thank you for the words of life that you have preserved for us in the scriptures that you have faithfully cared for and preserved and passed down even to this day. That you have made known to sinners the way that they might be saved. And you did it at great cost to yourself. And that you gave your Son, you sent your Son, God the Son, the Christ, to die for sins. Praise your name that you raised him from the dead, that he didn't just die from, for sins, but that you raised him to life so that all of us who call to him, look to him, put our trust in him, you save. Do that for everyone here this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.